This video is brought to you by the ASRock Z590 Extreme Wi-Fi 6E. If you're looking to do a build with an Intel 10th or 11th generation CPU, you should check out this board from ASRock. The big upgrade with the Z590 is you get one PCI Express 4.0 by 16 slot. Your primary PCI Express slot for your graphics card is now also PCI Express 4 when paired with an 11th gen core processor. On board for connectivity, we've got the Realtek 2.5 gigabit LAN, the Intel gigabit LAN, and a Wi-Fi 6E, that's 802.11ax module with Bluetooth 5.2, and two ASRock 2.4 and uh, five six gigahertz antennas. The motherboard is designed to be compatible with this metal bracket bracket that'll hold up the far end of your graphics card. How cool is that? This board also has some other high-end features like 20 gigabit USB Type-C, we've got a USB Type-C header right on the motherboard, and other connectivity for everything that you might need. And for the RGB, it's got two addressable headers, two regular RGB headers. It's fully compatible. You know, it's the ASRock Polychrome Sync, so you can run all of your other RGB accessories, and it's supported right out of the box. Power delivery system features 12K Nishikon caps for a long lifetime, <laughs> running hot, dumping the power into that 11th generation Intel CPU. So be sure to check out this motherboard for your next Intel build, and thanks ASRock for sponsoring this video. So you've been subscribed for our home automation series, and it's time to talk about the DSC alarm panel. Okay, well, we've already talked about that, but now it's time to actually do the installation. So normally this would be mounted on a wall, but uh, there's so many good guides for installing this alarm panel on the internet. I don't really wanna rehash it, and a lot of it is really well documented. DSC's website has a manual PDF you can download, and it's really information dense, but if you're just Joe Random person and you read it, you're not gonna know what they're really talking about, what they mean. So I'll show you, let's dive in. All right, so the first thing is you gotta have the right ingredients. You gotta have the alarm panel. Usually you'll get a box like this too that you can mount on the wall. It's got all these little holes. The holes are for actually plastic standoffs, plastic pegs, so you can install you know, like this is the ethernet connection for your alarm system. This is optional. This is from Invisalink. This, this clips on the side. Um, but you install all that kind of stuff in this panel. Usually also where it's mounted on the wall, you got the big, the big heavy lead acid battery. Well, it's no coincidence that this thing is the, basically the same thickness as one of these big lead, lead acid batteries. And this thing will run the entire alarm system blaring for pretty much 24 hours in, in a no power scenario. So we've got the panel, We've got a power brick, we've got the alarm, we've got a keypad panel, I've got a little packet of resistors. These are end of line resistors, we'll talk more about that. I've got the Invisalink thing, which is optional. I've got a motion sensor. These are four wire devices, they require power and they also communicate over the zone lines. And then I've also got a door sensor here somewhere. And then this, this is really small, four pin alarm wire. This looks a lot like Cat 3, which is used for phone lines. Not really a lot of distinction, if I'm honest. Uh, they actually make a special flexible drill bit for this stuff, so if you get really fancy with running the wire, you can use the long drill bit and it makes it really easy to fish this wire pretty much anywhere. It's a little easier to fish than Cat 5 or Cat 6. In a pinch you can use Cat 5 or Cat 6, but I've got some, some of this wired up here with our transformer. So you get the transformer and the panel and stuff like that, it doesn't really come with a pre-installed wire, so the first thing you do is wire up your, your transformer. This is AC, alternating current, so it doesn't really have polarity. I've twisted the red and green wires together along with yellow and black, and I've screwed them together under the terminal here. The other end of the wire, again, I've matched up my colors, so the colors are the same on both ends because otherwise it's gonna short out, and that will kill, kill your power brick. It's got, a, it's got an LED on there to let you know if it's dead or not. And then it's screwed into the panel here where it says uh, 16 volts AC. The anatomy of the rest of this alarm panel is basically down to these screw terminals. You're meant to shove wires under here and screw them down. Don't worry, this is all low voltage. There's not really any danger here because nothing's running at 110 volts. Nothing's really running at lethal voltages unless you shove them into your temples. And then probably not even then. The next terminals here are aux and then bell. Bell is the alarm bell. Then we've got labeling for red, black, green, and yellow. So this is the message bus. This is like the, the fancy part of this alarm. The alarm keypad and our Invisalink thing and any other alarm accessories you have will use this four wire bus. It's really a two wire bus with, with power. So on our alarm panel here, this is an old one. This is an RFK 5500. We've got four connections here, red, black, yellow, green. There's also a P slash Z input. So this can also be an alarm input. So if you wanna wire a door sensor 
or a motion sensor or something like that to this panel without actually running a zone wire to it, you can. You gotta assign this to a slot in the alarm, so there's an extra step that you have to do for configuration. But you can sort of daisy chain one zone off of your keypad panel. If you've got a keypad near a door, for example, it makes wiring that pretty easy because you can put your door sensor and your alarm panel basically on the same wire. So you get a wire from the door to the, the, the uh, you know, your keypad, and then you get the four conductor wire from the keypad all the way back to the alarm panel. So it works out pretty good. And then all of your other accessories just connect to the same terminal. You can daisy chain those however you want to do it. Now I'm going to make a recommendation. If you get a keypad, get a keypad that is alphanumeric. This is the older style. It's also an older firmware. So if you take it apart on the back here, it says V1.12. Uh, Ugh, old, old software. It's not very forgiving. It's not very user friendly. This particular panel I think is from like 2002. Ugh, it's very old. Yeah, I think the, the current firmware is like version 4 or version 5. You definitely want the newer firmware. There's also a lot of little details here where it's like, you know, don't reinvent your own alarm panel. So right here, when you, when you buy one of these new panels, it comes with a rubber button. And the button actually goes in the back of this plastic thing. So when you screw this into the wall, there's a button here on the wall. And so if somebody takes off your alarm, your, your keypad, uh, or moves it, or rips the whole thing off of the wall, this button will trigger, which will trigger an alarm, which is pretty awesome. It's kind of a kind of a dead man switch built into your alarm panel, which is pretty cool. There are also variations of this keypad. So like if you are going to use wireless sensors with your system, you can get a module that looks kind of like this one that's a standalone module that will let you use wireless sensors. But the smarter thing to do is to get a keypad that supports wireless zones because chances are your keypad is gonna be in a better position to receive those wireless signals than this, which is often located in a, in a closet or the basement or somewhere that's you know not gonna receive RF signals all that well. It's also a metal box, which is not good for propagating radio signals, whereas this is outside the metal box. So that's the RFK version of this. They even have really fancy ones that have the LCD display. But as with all of my videos on this and all of my warnings, be sure that you do not get any of the Neo accessories. Neo means incompatible. Neo means DSC is trying to steal your money because the, the Neo set doesn't work with any third party accessories. The magic of this system is that it works so amazingly well with third party accessories. The magic here is that we're basically giving this thing a brain tumor, uh, but the best kind of brain tumor, to be able to use Home Assistant for our home automation so that when there's a door that opens or motion is sensed or uh, the smoke alarm goes off or whatever, in addition to the functionality that's built into the alarm, Home Assistant will do stuff. Home Assistant will turn lights on and other things that the alarm system doesn't do, but just based on the stuff that's happening in the alarm. So the next thing from here is to wire up your control panel. Now by default, these panels have an installer code and a master code. And the installer code is better than the master code. You can use the installer code to reset the master code. The master code is the code that by default is used to set all of the other user codes for arming and disarming the alarm, and can also do a lot, but not all, of the programming. The master code is the one that's used for all of the programming. So out of the box, on a default DSC panel, that code, like ones like this, like the 1864, that code is 5555. On ADT panels, older ones, it's 6321, although sometimes it's not that. If it you know, isn't either one of those things, like you got it used on eBay, you can reset this. I've written a guide in the level one forum. You can connect a wire from you know program one to zone one, and disconnect all your other wires, turn this thing on for 30 seconds, and it may reset it. Check out the guide that'll walk you through that step by step if you get stuck or whatever. But you can also program these so they cannot be reset. And that's really nice from a security standpoint, because like, banks and other things will use this and they don't want you know a burglar to be able to reprogram their alarm system surreptitiously so you can actually set a fuse that makes it really difficult uh, to impossible to reprogram these or reset them and when that happens you basically just have to get a new control panel or a new control board so if you're buying stuff on ebay be sure that you do that the other nice thing about you know having an alarm system based on this pre-existing technology and not creating your own is it has a lot of really cool functions like you can have a duress code so that you can put in a code and it will turn the alarm off but it will also signal that you're in duress so it'll still call the police and it'll still call you know whoever and things will happen based on the code that you put in which is really kind of awesome so once you get it hooked up you're basically ready to program 
and it's gonna beep helpfully to let you know something is terribly wrong. I've got the alert here, it should be a green check mark, letting me know that it's, it's ready to arm, but uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, it's pretty cool. Now this is the alphanumeric keypad, and this is just like an old school numeric keypad. So this one, when you hook it up, it doesn't have date and time, it's not like an alphanumeric display. This one is a lot harder to program. You gotta have a much better idea of what's going on when you program it with that than you do with this one. You should definitely shut the panel down when you're wiring in things to the control bus. But see, I've got my four wires set up here. It wants a date and time. You know, you can actually hit the arrow keys and it's like, oh, what zones are open? Oh, all of those zones. And you can actually rename the zone here. Although renaming the zone actually takes place in the the keypad rather than the panel. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the manual really, like no video that I could do would be a replacement for the manual. Check out the guide in the level one forum because it's kind of a cheat sheet, but there's a bunch of terminology there and if you just go in blind, it's it'll seem like an impenetrable wall of crazy. So installer codes, master code, all that. Star eight. All right, so the first thing that you do is you get your physical wiring done and, and theoretically you would have a bunch of wires going in here for your zones. I'm not gonna talk about wiring in this, although you can you can ask questions, maybe I should do another video on that. But the first section, 001, it's going to say, what do you need to enter? Like what zone type? Now there's a table of zone types, both in the manual and on the level one forum. Now remember, if we do it on this kind of a panel, it doesn't give you really any indication that it wants anything, and it also doesn't show you on the screen what it was previously programmed for. It just wants you to enter 16 pairs of numbers. It's not great. So what you're doing is entering the zone type for the first 16 zones in the system. Even though you've only got eight physical hardwired zones, it's done in 16 zones at a time. So zone 001 is the first 16 zones, zone 002 is the second 16 zones, and so on. Uh, if you look at the zone type, 00 is null zone, not used. So if you, you know, you live in a one bedroom house and there's not really that much to worry about and you're not using all eight of your physical hardwired zones, then you can set them to the null zone, 00. Although I would use up all your physical zones before doubling up on sensors. Like you could put all your door sensors on one zone and then you just know that a door was opened but you gotta think about alarm strategy too, because if like somebody comes in a door that should never come in, that should alarm immediately. And you can't do that if you've got some of your door sensors that you want to arm immediately and some that you want to, the alarm panel will give you a little bit of a delay to enter the code on the same zone. So think about that as you're arranging your physical wiring. And you know, one device per zone, it kinda works. Also for wireless, pretty much across the board, wireless is one device per zone. This keypad does have a wireless receiver in it, and that's programming section 900. So like you see in the manual, it's like programming section 001. Well, that's what I just did, section 001. There's also keypad programming. So I'm gonna hit pound to go back. Now it says intersection, but watch this. I entered star, now it says enter LCD section. So this is an entirely different set of section codes just for the LCD. And so like one of the sections is labels. So if I want to label my entry door, not zone one, but like entry door, I can actually do that here. So it's like ABC, DEF, GHI. So ABC, DEF, E, E, and then next I can use my arrow key, ABC, DEF, GHI, JKL, MN, and you can use star to change case. So star is also saved, so you want to use that. The change case, lowercase is now selected. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N. And then you can move on to the next one and so on. And then when you're done, you can just do save. Now you can also do, uh, I think it's 998 and broadcast labels. If you have more than one keypad hooked up and you say yes, this will send whatever you just programmed in this keypad for those zone labels to all of your other zone labels, which is pretty cool. We're gonna go back to zone one, and I've got sort of a little test set up on our level one forum. All right, so for our level one guide, I've got, you know, just use your imagination here, I've got zone one set up as our entry door, and zone two is our entry hall motion. And so the idea here is that when the alarm is armed, 
I'm only ever gonna use one door in my house to go in and out. So like you've got a, probably a front door and a side door and a back door and maybe a basement door or crawl space door, all those different doors. I'm gonna wire up the entry door, the door that I always use, the one that's physically near the keypad panel so that when it opens, that it doesn't immediately set off the alarm. There's a little bit of a delay. These have built-in zone types to deal with that. And then if the door opens and it sees motion, then it doesn't, it still doesn't set off the alarm. But then if there's other motion from other motion sensors in the house or other door sensors are set off, that does set off the alarm. If somebody comes in the front door, that'll set off the alarm. If somebody opens a window, there's window sensors, that will set off the alarm. And so there's a little bit of a distinction in how that zone is programmed. You also gotta think about the situation where you have motion for the entry the entry area, but the door did not open. That would also instant alarm. And so the panel is smart enough to deal with that. There's also this idea of away and stay programming. So with stay programming, you're setting your alarm, but you're, ha you're, you know, you're home. Somebody's gonna break into your house while you're sleeping. Well, you know, uh, you go into your bedroom or you set the alarm and then you go into your bedroom and you go to sleep. So maybe you get up in the middle of the night and you go get a snack. Well, your alarm panel might see motion in your house and say, okay, is that a burglar? And that's the difference between away and stay. If you have a stay arm and you've got your zone set up correctly, when it sees motion, it will not trip. But if it sees a door open and the alarm is still armed, it will absolutely trip. So if you've got a mix of glass break sensors and other stuff like that, it can set off the alarm. There's also the concept of smoke alarms. Even though the alarm panel isn't armed, maybe you want it to call the fire department and maybe you want it to call the fire department on a delay. It's like, oh, we're making garlic bread. It's not really super serious. So there's this idea of a zone that's a 24 hour fire delay. So if the smoke detector detects smoke, you've got 30 seconds to get to the panel and put in a code or put in a, you know, get to the panel and tell it, yes, I've acknowledged the fire alarm. Don't call the fire department. It's just the garlic bread. But if you're, you know, out in your yard or something and something catches on fire and your alarm was not armed, if you don't silence it, if you don't, you know, you hear the alarm and you don't make it to the panel in 30 seconds, maybe it'll call the fire department if you've set it up that way with the monitoring service. So in, all in all, I mean, the, the codes for zones go up to like 80, although there's not 80 in total. So check out the, the table in the manual so that you understand the different kinds of zones. And by the way, the subtlety and nuance here, imagine trying to DIY this in a system. There's so many cool features. Anyway, let's program our zones. So star eight, our installer code. Remember your ADT installer code might be 6321, intersection, uh, zero, zero, 001 for our first 16 zones. And we look at the zones that are in the how-to, so we match them up. So that's gonna be uh, 01, 04, 03, 03, 03, 07, 07, 03. And then I'm not using zones uh, eight through 16, they're not hardwired. I don't have an additional module in here for more hardwired zones. Any wireless zones, cause this is a wireless zone panel. I'm gonna assign those to zone 17 and all, just in case I wanna add more wired zones to this at some point in the future. So I'm just gonna say zero, zero. Nice. Okay. So, secure system before arming. Open zones, zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four. Okay, well, we, we gotta give it a minute. <laughs> Notice also that it now says a different zone name here where we changed it, which is pretty cool. Yeah, so notice that open zones, it's only gonna cycle through the three open zones now because I've disabled the other zones in the system which is really awesome. Now, if you've got a wireless device, uh, a wireless device is gonna have a code on it. Like when you look on the back, it's got a sticker. To enroll a wireless device, it's 804. Again, check the manual, 804 to enroll your device, and then you tell it what zone you wanna assign it to. So in my case, I said 17, and then you entered the hex data. And so this is the hex thing. So this doesn't have A through F, hexadecimal is zero through nine, A through F, but on the sticker, it'll show you the thing that you need to key in. So it'll be like one, two, three, star, four, which will you know put in an alphabetic character and so on and so forth. And so once you do this, 
then it takes you back to intersection so that you can enroll another wireless device. Now the other thing that you got to do, since I did 17, is uh, 002. So I'm going to say, hey, that zone type is uh, you know, a motion sensor or a door sensor and it's an immediate or a delay or whatever, I need to set the type there as well. There's a worksheet in the back of the manual, which is amazing. You can write everything down and it really is super easy to follow along with the worksheet. So I definitely suggest that you do that. So this is by no means comprehensive, but this is a really quick way to get started with one of these. Technically, there's also um, module enrollment. That's what it is in the manual. And so there's, this keypad also has a wireless controller in it and you want to enroll the uh, wireless system in the panel. So there's a 900 series code, it's nine something, um, that you can use to scan the system and it'll find the wireless keypad. Because you gotta have a wireless interface in order to get the wireless sensors to work correctly. And doing it through the keypad is much better than you know, a, uh, one of these panels with it built in or having it inside a metal box because radio frequency through a metal box, although it usually comes with antennas, but the keypads are usually really good. Uh, there's also some other tips and tricks that you can do for these. Like if you're not gonna hook up a physical phone line because you're doing monitoring over the internet, you can tell this thing that, hey, it's cool that there's no phone line plugged in because by default out of the box, they're looking for a phone line, an old school analog telephone uh, telephone line physically wired up inside this panel here. Uh, one other thing that I will tell you about, but I'm not going to show you in this video, is programmable outputs. There's multiple programmable outputs here. One of the programmable outputs can drive like 300 milliamps, so that's like a really serious control here. When we did our uh, outlet control, like you could wire in program one or program two here and <laughs> set this thing up so when it sees motion in zone two that it would close you know, the program one input or output or whatever. But it's really kind of clunky in programming it this way, not, not really great. Uh, in the other examples in the other videos that I did, rather than using the programmable outputs here, Home Assistant just monitors this module and then controls other automation stuff like Sonoff or Z-Wave or, uh, you know, Zigbee devices, whatever you want to do. Um, this could be a bridge to any other automation that you want to layer on. I mean, this continues to work and is standalone just fine, but you can layer on your home automation on top of it, but you gotta have a good and well set up home alarm system in order to do that. And of course you can contact a local professional, you know, home installer, like alarm installer to do that. It's just that they really want that monthly subscription agreement because you get, you know, a couple of hundred uh, people subscribing to your alarm service and you're basically set for life because that's recurring monthly income for customers that you sold, you know, a year ago or two years ago or five years ago, it, it can be a good source of income, but it's pretty easy to do, do yourself too and get pretty good monitoring. There's also these end of line resistors. So if you're retrofitting an existing kit or looking at some of the other demos, they'll actually suggest that you install these resistors at the panel, but that's not the point of these resistors. So check out this wire. Like, let's assume that I was a bad guy and I've got my, my sensor wire here going to a motion detector. This motion detector, will close the wire, it'll short it out basically, if motion is detected on the wire. You could actually have a couple of motion sensors because you know you can configure these for pet immunity, you can configure them on a delay, you can, can configure how big your room is. Like that, those are jumpers inside this, this motion sensor. But you might need a couple of motion sensors to cover an area or go around a corner, whatever. Um, if the bad guy can somehow get to the wire, like maybe they can open the window just, to, just a hair, and get to the, the sensor on the, on, the, on the window, if they can cut the wire, then the sensor can never short it out, right? Well, that's what these resistors are for. So these resistors put the line for the sensor in between open and closed. So if a bad guy cuts the wire, it's gonna change the overall resistance of the wire. If the bad guy shorts the wire out, it's gonna change the overall resistance of the wire. It will trip the alarm no matter what you do, which is really awesome. But it's important that these these resistors be installed at the end of the line. So the farthest sensor that is from the panel, that's where the resistor goes. Because if the resistor is located at the panel, depending on how you've got your sensors wired up, if they're normally open sensors or normally closed sensors, the panel may not be able to detect that somebody has messed with the wire far out if the resistor is located here at the panel. Again, it kind of depends on your, on your sensors. You luck out in one sensor configuration where it doesn't really matter too much. But the best practice is that you're Resistors always go at the end of the line. That's why they're called end of line resistors. 
Oh, and there's one, there's one exception pay attention to in the manual. Uh, some smoke detectors require a double end of line resistor. So you have to configure the panel for that. Hopefully this introduction to the manual and some of the terminology will make the programming manual a little less impenetrable because I really do think this is a great foundation for home automation. So I'm Wendell, this is level one. This has been a quick look at programming your DSC alarm system with an eye toward home automation. This is like the fourth or fifth or sixth video in this series. It'll make a lot more sense if you watch the other videos in the series. Uh, narrator, it did not. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm Wendell, this is level one. I'm signing out and I'll see you later.